I was running for my life. The whole platform was full of people. Some were crying, some were very sad, but all of them gave a feeling as if they have lost their lives. Maybe some of them had lost their relations. When I found my place in the train, I was mistaken for a Muslim. Really? Yeah. So they said, prove that you are Hindu. You had to prove that you were a Hindu? Yeah. And how did you do that? Well, the Muslims have uh, something done to distinguish themselves from Hindus. So you circumcision? To, yeah, circumcision. Yeah. This was a sort of trial. A trial? Open trial. Yeah, yeah, open trial. Prove it. I had to prove that by taking of my pen. You had to take so your trousers I, down? Yes, I said, no, no, you can't do that. So if I hadn't done it, I would have been killed. It came to me that uh, both sides, if you say Islam has generosity, no. Or if you say Hindus have forgiven us, no, because they were all beasts at that time. They were killing people. And they, 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 were, they were not human beings, I would say. The feelings and the emotions of the people who remember what happened here on this station, they're so raw still, they're so vivid. This happened more than 60 years ago, but they can remember it with tremendous clarity, but also with a sense of loss, that the life that they led before was so much better in terms of relations between Hindus and Sikhs and Muslims. And they now realize that there's no going back and that this argument between India and Pakistan goes on and on and relations between the two countries are still as bad as ever because of what happened in this area more than 60 years ago. Between the great bridge building projects of the late 19th century and 1947, the rail network doubled in size to 40,000 miles in length. But because India's railways had been constructed to serve British interests first and foremost, partition had a devastating effect on the railways themselves. The network was ruthlessly dismembered in a way which made little practical sense. Both India and Pakistan's main lines simply stopped at their new political border. Pakistan was left with lines whose prime purpose was to transport goods to the ports and cities of the old Indian Empire. The east-west main line, as envisaged by the rail network's creator, Governor General Lord Dalhousie, today stretches from Calcutta to just past Amritsar, a distance of nearly 1,200 miles. These tracks are, in effect, going nowhere. Just two trains a week cross into Pakistan. I'm stopping here at the border. At the official border crossing, a ceremony is held which has the effect of highlighting the differences between the two countries. What they're shouting is, long live India, long live India. And you've got this extraordinary, theatrical scene, both sides of the border, shouting out their slogans, showing how patriotic they are. Every evening, the Indian and Pakistan border guards try to outdo each other in military swagger. Crowds on both sides raucously chant their support. This is one of the two official crossings between India and Pakistan. In this nightly ritual, the guards briefly set foot territory, only to slam the gate shut on their shared history. 
It's a pantomime which disguises the tragedy of modern India. Mahatma Gandhi became the spiritual leader and father of an independent India at the cost of India itself. The India of the Raj, partly created and sustained by the railway network, was now derailed. If there was a real war between India and Pakistan, there wouldn't be a, a phony confrontation like this. Both sides are armed with nuclear weapons and Armageddon would beckon. But for the time being, they're content with having these mock battles, spending a lot of their time sprucing up and then flaunting their improbable uniforms. I came to India to ride the rails, to discover how they were constructed and to explore their legacy. Here at the border, it's obvious that railways aren't always built along straight lines. They bend and sometimes break with the politics of the country, and nowhere more so than here. To have the Indian railways effectively stopping here on the border with Pakistan would have seemed particularly pointless to the 19th century governor general and railway pioneer, Lord Dalhousie. For him, the railway network was a way of exerting power from West Pakistan right across the subcontinent to Burma. To have this great divide between India and Pakistan would have seemed to him like the total failure of his imperial dream. What has come across so strongly in my journey is that both Dalhousie and Gandhi, in their own ways, had exactly the same aim to unite India. Gandhi lived to see independence and the tragedy of partition, but he died before the last of the British troops left the country. In life, he claimed, the railways were inherently evil. But in death, his ashes would be taken across India in state by train. Not only that, but his ashes were scattered in the holy waters of Mother Ganga, the river Ganges which the Victorians' love of technology had threatened to defile at Varanasi. After all their work to unite India, it was a cruel irony that when the British left here, India was divided. The benefits of the imperial legacy are still open to argument. The tracks of empire are made of more than iron and steel. The English language, the legal system, even democracy, they too spread out across the country. And it was the railways which helped take them there. First proposed by Lord Dalhousie 160 years ago, the railways had become central to the life of the independent nation Gandhi fought so hard to create. He's revered above so many others in India, and so are the railways. As Dalhousie himself wrote in his famous memorandum, a magnificent system of railway communication would present a series of public monuments, vastly surpassing in real grandeur the aqueducts of Rome, the pyramids of Egypt, the Great Wall of China, the temples, palaces and mausoleums of the Great Mughal Monuments. But the rail network is far from being a monument or a mausoleum. The legacy left by the railway builders enables 13 million Indians every day to travel the length and breadth of their nation, the fourth biggest railway in the world in the largest democracy. India without the railways, it just wouldn't be possible. And the building of the Indian Railway continues here on BBC4 tomorrow at the same time. Next tonight, we get all musical for a trip down memory lane to Live Aid 25 years later. <laughs>